Welcome to the Film Steins, a double feature podcast. Join us as we unravel the interwoven experience of the continuous conversation of cinema. Take part in pairing movies with their cursed counterparts, movies that share DNA, or even pairing questionable duos by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash filmsteins. We offer tiers at the $1, $5, and $20 level, where the $5 tier will grant the ability to request films to further the discussion. So grab some popcorn, sit back, and get ready to join the 100-year conversation. This is the Film Steins, where movies are more than just entertainment, they're an experience. They're And welcome back to another episode of the Film of Steins. Thank you guys for joining us today. Today I am joined by my blood bag friend, Lucy. Hello, everyone. Remember, we post every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on patreon.com slash film of Steins. Some recent episodes include Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, Sasquatch Sunset, the very first Mad Max, Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, and Mad Max 3, Beyond Thunderdome. Remember to leave nice comments, thoughts, and ideas on our Patreon as well. Go rate us on Apple Podcasts. Come by and request a movie. Come subscribe for a dollar. We appreciate all the support. Thank you guys very much. Are you stressed and filled with anxiety like I am? Maybe in a bit of pain from that car accident you had a few years ago? Well, the sponsor of today's episode, Hempville CBD, has us covered. They have the highest quality products created by chemists and doctors. Hempville carries everything from CBD to THC dispensary grade without those despicable dispensary prices. Order your Delta 8, 9, edibles, and vapes along with the THCA flower and get free shipping when you spend $50 or more at HempvilleCBD.com. Check out the link in the description for more details. But today we are discussing George Miller's 2015 film, Mad Max Fury Road. I just wanted to start off by saying that this is one of the greatest movies ever made. And movies on this scale of, you know, many hundreds of millions of dollars, very expensive looking movies, you know, your Marvels and Planet of the Apes and whatnot, very easily the best of that blockbuster sized movie. Just wanted to set the stage, set the road for that. Fury Road, like the rest of the Mad Maxes, continue this path into being very strange next to themselves. I do believe this has its deepest roots in Mad Max 2. Kind of like what you said about inspiring a whole movie. The car scene inspired a whole movie, not Mad Max 2. Yeah, thank you. This movie operates on biblical proportions. I think it has a little bit more of a clear allegorical tie-in and after watching all four of these back to back i can definitely say tom hardy is my favorite mad max i know you asked and we see the return of everyone's favorite angle of mad max with his return to form and being that legendary mythological creature that just shows up in the nick of time or at the right time right place to help someone in need and it just so happens to be a proper main character with furiosa I think we see a lot of Jesus in this movie, which is really funny because our last Tom Hardy movie was The Revenant, which I felt was begging to be a little more biblically tied or energized, but just had a hard time saying anything outside of its revenge tale. But I'm very happy you have finally seen this movie with your new Shinigami eyes. I can't remember if you've seen it way back when. But how do you feel about Mad Max Fury Road today? Yeah, so I watched this movie probably when it became available on streaming. So maybe 2017, 18, around then. And I only watched like the first 10 minutes before I was done with it. Or I might have fallen asleep. Who knows? And I just thought this movie wasn't for me. But man, you were right boy was I wrong this movie is totally for me I'm really surprised how much I loved it I don't know if it's you know right place right time right mindset or my movie tastes have definitely developed (laughs) you finally like some good movies I finally like some good movies not that the bad movies I like aren't going away now I just (laughs) like it all but I also think watching the original movies helped. And 
not only help me appreciate this movie, but definitely help me understand it and understand what Mad Max is and his world. Because I feel like that was a very small part of the problem as well, because, you know, 10 minutes into this movie, you're meeting these crazy characters and you're just thrown into this world that if you weren't a fan, you're not going to immediately get. Even as a fan, it's quite the deep end. There's a lot of expectation here coming from George Miller, which I really appreciate because it's, at the end of the day, not all that complicated. Yes, yes, I agree. I definitely agree. I mean, this movie, compared to the other ones, is on a whole nother level. It's very ballsy for you to say that this is the best type of blockbuster type of film, but I, I'm not going to completely disagree with you. This movie is metal and it's insane and I don't know if I've ever seen anything quite like it. I think this movie is also like a perfect blend of Mad Max 2 and Mad Max 3. I like what you said about Mad Max 2 that we have this kind of allegory going on and it has those elements from Mad Max 2 with the car scene. But it also keeps some of the complexity and emotion from Mad Max 3 that hits it a lot better than Mad Max 3 tried to hit it. So I like that. I love that the plot is very simple. We're not trying to be super extra. We know what we're doing here. And we rely on the action to really tell the movie and keep us entertained and basically interpret what this movie is about. And also the cinematography here. I know it's 30 years after Thunderdome. So there's a lot of time for technology to boom and for directors and such to finally have beautiful cinematography and a style and aesthetic not to mention this film was in pre-production in some form for like 25 years so it better have looked good at the <laughs> very least <laughs> that's true i didn't know that but yeah the cinematography is a whole lot better than the originals and it's very beautiful and it's very orange and it's very dune like and i like it again we have a different tone from the other ones but that's no surprise these movies like to switch tone on us and i'm fine with it it works for me each adventure that max has is a different tone all right cool i like that we have some easter eggs here and some nods to the original films i love when directors do that and keep the fans trying to guess and keep us on our toes. The score here has definitely improved. It's more diverse. It's not that 80s orchestra type of score. We have a real score for once. We definitely have a real score for once. Not that I'm against the old score, but the score, of course, is better and fitting. The pacing is great. I'm not mad at it. But the two best things about the film are the characters. More specifically, our bad guys and how we kept this world very car centric, like our other films have been, but just magnified it. Every good action movie needs cars. Just saying. Whether it's a car chase, cars blowing up, something, a car needs to be there. But as much as I like this movie, I think there were three weak parts for me that I wasn't sold on. And that was the wives and their characters. I don't know if the characters weren't explored enough or if it was the acting from these ladies here. I don't know. I wasn't sold on it. But they're not the main characters. So maybe I don't have a problem with it. And then we have Furiosa's motivations, which I totally didn't get from this movie alone. And the weird dreams slash visions Max was experiencing. I don't know what I was supposed to feel while watching these images. Besides that, Max is disturbed. And I know there's some bizarreness, some strangeness to these movies, but I feel like this one didn't quite work for me. Yeah, I think we sacrificed a lot of, if not all, of the surrealistic elements and some of these touchstones that went on to inspire things like Fallout. It doesn't feel quite like the same place. Of course, a lot of time has passed. And we have new rulers of the land. So, of course, places like Bartertown don't stand a chance against an army. But this movie feels like it went in more of the direction of the Road Warrior. In almost every form, but especially its storytelling. 
we're less interested in telling you about the economy and the possibilities of what this world can have in it, like stories and stuff. And again, more interested in kind of the myth of Mad Max. This movie could have taken place on a different planet. Other than the fact that we see all of these vehicles are kind of merges of many other vehicles and stuff. There's this very neat touchstone to, you know, what things used to be, of course, which is visually, you know, a masterpiece. But things become so alien and big that they lose all touch with what things used to be like. And in a different timeline, I think you could have seen a, the Road Warrior sequel or Mad Ma- the, the what would have been Mad Max 3 could have been a different movie and it would have made complete sense into this movie instead of Beyond Thunderdome ever happening. In other words, I feel like the imaginative element has kind of disappeared and your mind doesn't wander so much about what else is out there beyond Gastown, Bullet Farm, and the Citadel. There's a lot of things I like about this movie, but my favorite thing is the simpatico of the visual language mixed with the score, of course. But the way people move while attacking and how the cars move with the score happening and the editing, these crazy zoom-in shots, whatever, however, whatever that is, they are, like when they're driving, we get this frontal shot of them and it crashes in on them. It's awesome. It's probably my favorite edited film of all time. It's probably my favorite score of all time, too. Yeah, I feel like the editing part, yeah, I completely agree with you about the editing part, especially when our focus is on the war boys. And we know the war boys, they're chaotic with their behaviors and the way they talk and stuff. So especially the scenes edited around them, those scenes are chaotic. Yeah, the sportsmanship between them is unlike anything I've ever seen. The way they captured the war boys' transcendence into Valhalla was in itself transcendent. The mid-battle celebratory nonsense that would happen, this, them spraying themselves with chrome because of this weird association they have with chrome being perfection or like kind of transcendent in its own right divine is awesome. No, I'm right there with you. The war boys are definitely my favorite part of the movie. It's like there was so much love that went into creating them. And I love this idea that to them there's honor in dying. And basically being brainwashed to worship and die for Immortan Joe. And I was curious why the chrome. And you saying that. That it was basically, that is this representation of divinity. And it's based off the engines, right? The V8s? Because they have an altar of steering wheels in one scene. It's just like, it's like the Game of Thrones throne, but steering wheels. I mean, it was crazy. And they worship the V8. This is their strength. This is their power. That's what the hand thing is. They cross four fingers in a V formation for V8. For V8. Yeah, exactly. So that makes sense now. The the, the chrome spray in the mouth. Because I didn't quite get that until you said that. I was like, oh, genius. And I think that's also the first tie we'll have to Moby Dick. Because a big theme of Moby Dick is that the whale is white. And it's it's just this transcended representation of God itself. And how we forever chase it. And it steals and gives and... Yeah, I don't know if I've read Moby Dick to know that, but... Another big literal representation of the Moby Dick is the rig itself and how, you know, they're chasing it. And it is the glimmer of hope. And I'm not saying there's a biblical story here, but it becomes very overt when we have a truck full of women. I suppose they're all pregnant, but we have one that's very pregnant. Because they're baby makers, right? Yeah, those are just his favorite wives. Yeah. But then we have man and woman leading them to paradise. Kind of maybe reminiscent of Adam and Eve driving Moby Dick. (laughs) While being chased by Immortan Joe, who is in himself a god to his people, literally. And then we constantly get the, the echo of Valhalla and his people transcending and then we 
and we get a great representation of that space between life and death with the war boys being white i would assume another parallel to just sell the moby dick thing but not try to retell it in some kind of allegorical sense just have it there for more of a symbolic reason one of my favorite parts probably top five is when nux is driving next to morton joe and he tries to get his attention and he's like he looked at me it's my favorite part that might be my favorite part of the movie actually yeah <laughs> but just to run home the biblical imagery so i don't forget we're introduced to max he's got long hair He's not a man of many words, and he also provides Nux with blood. And that especially ran home with me when he offered his blood at the end to Furiosa, which is also my favorite part. (laughs) But it's especially over the top when we see Max basically crucified to the front of Nux's car, and then we also see Max take an arrow right through the hand. I'm sure there's many more points to kind of put this in a biblical size telling of a better story, but those are some of the ones I noticed. Yeah, I don't think I noticed a lot of those, but I like that you bring them up, especially when we're here in this sand infested place, similar to Dune. Like, I'm sure there's some Mm -hmm, allegorical shit in Dune like that, that just goes over my head really. That's not what I'm there for, you know, but that kind of sand element just puts you there for sure. Because in Mad Max 2, we have a lot of sand. One other thing I wanted to point out visually was this cartoonification sort of of the actual characters and that we have a Morton Joe who looks like a Morton Joe. We have an armless girl driving a big rig. We have a group of girls. We have a section of girls who are like large and breastfeed. And then we have in Morton Joe's varied children, like that little dude in the chair. You know, of course, the people eater and the bullet farmer with his bullet powdered wig kind of thing. But it challenges me with none of this feels cartoony at the same time. It's very grounded. It's very lethal. It doesn't feel, you know, kind of flamboyant like cartoons tend to feel with not really having any rules yeah it's probably a great mark to the world building and making you feel like this is an actual world where this could potentially happen and again i feel like the original films and watching these original films so close to the time we watch this movie just grounds that because a lot of these characters are dressed very similar to a lot of the characters in the original movies. Even though it's crazier here and maybe much better put together, again, because of the time and the resources, it just grounds it. I don't know. Yeah, the presence of someone like Furiosa is a lot to ask of the audience because she's a real character with motives, like you said, that you didn't totally jive with. But Mad Max is our eyes, for the most part, And he just kind of more or less appears in this story. So it's one of those big asks of George Miller for his audience to just get behind. So I see your problem from a story point of view. But from a literal point of view, I guess, of course, if anyone knows about such a place, a greener place in this world, you're going to be doing everything you can to get there. The wives were... Definitely the weaker as far as the little performance that they had. It almost felt like they were supposed to be these angel-like things. Not a lot of personality. We see that kind of line blur with Zoe Kravitz's character. Toast, I think her name was. I don't know if that was said. But she's kind of cut of the same cloth as Furiosa. Or the people who know how to stay alive, at least, in this world. Yeah, my problem with Furiosa is that we focus on her a little too much. We kind of make her this main character all of a sudden. And I know this movie has very little dialogue, but we do give her some dialogue. And at one point, she's talking with Max. And I don't know exactly what he asks her, but 
something along the lines of like why are you doing this and she says for redemption and we don't really get a redemption from what i don't really get why we need to give a crap about furiosa besides that yeah there's a green place and we were hopeful we want something better but just specifically her why she's all of a sudden a main character yeah i mean it's kind of funny that you say that because you could say the same thing about Papagayo and Mad Max too. But we don't have that main focus on him like we do with Furiosa. Yeah. They're both kind of the heroes in their story, but our eyes are completely on Mad Max and Mad Max 2. And here, we're definitely shared between the two. So I get that. You could have seen this movie be called Furiosa. Right. A Mad Max saga. or <laughs> Like the new one. <laughs> Especially because she's such a feminist icon when she, you talk about this film. She's a feminist icon. Apparently. And I, I don't understand. I didn't know that. Yeah. I think that's a little lame because I think she's more of an icon and symbol for hope and the propagation of a different kind of humanity, not really related to women specifically. Women are just super important in that process, obviously. Yeah, not the oppression of women. Yeah. So to say. But yeah, it's the messaging and the motivations behind Furiosa that I can't quite get behind. But I get it. This is just another story that Mad Max has been at the right place, right time, like you said, and has helped along the way. And has remained kind of hopeful for mankind. When Furiosa is dying and she needs blood... And Max offers his his wine. It's one of the most powerful moments I've ever seen in movies. And then he tells Furiosa, oh, my name is Max. I'm like, oh, shit. How are you going to cry in a Mad Max movie? And then they set that up in the very beginning, indicating that Max is a universal blood donor, which is awesome. How do they know he's a universal blood donor? They may not have a lot of science out there in the Citadel, but they know how to engineer vehicles they know how to worship and they know how to test for your blood type <laughs> i think there was something missing for that to be a powerful scene for me i don't know if it was the chemistry between furiosa and max that i just wasn't there for should we have had max fall in love with furiosa no because there's almost this deeper gut punch when you're saving a comrade like sure. we had here absolutely patriotism is transcendent in feeling we saw that all over the place in godzilla minus one i think my issue is just with furiosa's character that didn't make her lovable enough for me <laughs> to feel something there like it did with nux that was the most heartbreaking scene in the I actually everything with him was the most heartbreaking thing ever these war boys are dying if they're not killing themselves for Immortan Joe they have these lumps and bumps they have these tumors and they're not created to live long and it's fine I'm fine with it until you make us fall in love with one how are you going to create this very lovable character Knowing he's going to die. Because if he doesn't die from his sacrifice, which he attempts three times and he's denied three <laughs> times, he's going to die of cancer from the radiation. He's got his lumps, Barry and Larry, that he adds little smiley faces to. And he knows that. He is aware that these bumps and lumps are going to kill him. People like him don't live long. People like him don't live long. And he, he's, he himself is also after redemption <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> he fucks Ex up. Exactly. And if Max would have given his blood to save Nux like he did for Furiosa, then I would have bawled. That would have been a moment. I don't know how that would have fit, but man, that would have been explosive. But we did give Nux that embryonic kind of infatuation stage with one of the wives. We gave him a taste of humanity. I know, which is probably the best character arc in this movie he all of a sudden really had something to die for 
a real sacrifice. And it was so heartbreaking. He's just another representation, the best representation of hope and change. Yes. Yeah. Especially after we gave him an existential crisis. Because that's not what these boys are for. They're not here for them. We're, they're not here to think, to become individuals. They're here for sacrifice. Um, I think George Miller compared them to kamikaze pilots. That's what they're there for. Which is funny, you bring up the Godzilla Minus One reference. Maybe there's something there to that. But Nux is definitely my favorite character. He's definitely someone that was very lovable and memorable in this movie. And he wasn't a main character like Furiosa was. And I just wanted something from her too. I'd almost argue he was part of the main character. And that he was that changing character that representation of the most important part of this movie is and being hope yeah yeah but we we didn't give him as much screen time that's fair as her (laughs) and we didn't make him drive the war rig and save the wives and drive to the green place we gave that to her and i don't know what she did with it but I'm, i'm not too mad at it i'm just there was just something there that didn't hit it home for me to make me completely be in love with this. Because Tom Hardy, I like him for Mad Max. I liked him here in this universe. He's kind of moody. He's kind of broody. He doesn't talk. There's obvi- there's obviously something bothering him, something troubling him. He's got some PTSD um, I was reading somewhere that the visions he's getting is not of a particular child, but just the representation of all these people he couldn't save, which is not something the original Mad Max would be troubled by. So we made him a little different here. And that was kind of my connection to him. He feels a little bit grittier. So I really liked him for this role. So I'm kind of with you on that, him being the better Mad Max. Less dialogue, and with the less dialogue, he definitely amplifies the legendary aspect. Just another echo of Mad Max 2, really. Yeah. Yeah, I think he has probably the most dialogue in the first one and third one. How did you feel about Immortan Joe? Well, Immortan Joe is probably the coolest warlord i can't really call him a bad guy you know he's trying to bring order to a a completely unsalvageable place he's a bad guy he's nasty and he's cruel (laughs) sure he's got women enslaved too in different hierarchies and and he's limiting the water supply up to the point that they're all killing each other when he does give them five seconds of water flow i can't blame him there's (laughs) such little water I wouldn't want to be in his position, you know, (laughs) being like a president oriented person and having to dole out literal resources in this way is maybe requires some kind of totalitarian mindset. Maybe there's a time and place for dictatorships. I'm not sure. He's awesome. His characterization is awesome. The way he looks is awesome. I I can't even begin to think how you design someone like this. His 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 brothers in arms are even awesome, especially the people eater. I love him. I love when he touches his nipples. It's so <laughs> awesome, man. I'll tell you what. Do you know who plays Immortan Joe? I did see that. I was wondering if you were going to see Same guy who plays Toe Cutter. I did see that because I saw a fan theory of how Toe Cutter becomes Immortan Joe. And I think that's a little far-fetched. We see him get totally... <laughs> yeah run over and destroyed by the 18 wheeler or whatever truck he he's a goner he's he didn't come back he didn't become immortan joe i think that's far-fetched but i like where they're going with it i do like his outfit he's got like this like faux muscle looking plastic because we see him without it like briefly when someone's blowing like some kind of powder on him and he doesn't have abs but then when he puts on that plastic armor, he all of a sudden has abs. And I absolutely love that. That's hilarious. I love the mask on his face. I like that he can open it and he looks insane. 
But one of my favorite things about him is that he's also dying like these war boys are. He's also got some blisters, I don't know, some kind of repercussions from the radiation. But he's fighting it and he's healing somehow. Probably hence the name, right? Immortan Joe sounding like immortal because he's lived for so long with those ailments. It's awesome. It's so fucking creative. I know you like the people eater, but he disturbs me. He's probably not my favorite character. He's probably too good at his role that he disturbed me a little bit too much. I love the people eater. I love his big foot. Does he have diabetes? Is that a big ass tumor growing in his foot? I love how he dies. Max puts his foot on the accelerator and he's just, it's awesome. Yeah, funny enough, the bullet farmer is probably the more vanilla of the three. And the bullet farmer's death is also glorious. Happens at night. The night shots in this movie are awesome. I've never seen a more beautiful monochromatic image just in my life. It's unbelievable. But when they blind the bullet farmer, he puts that bandana over his eyes. He's just shooting like a Metal Gear Solid character or something. And it just continuously outdoes itself time and time again. It's unbelievable. Yeah, speaking of the night shots, I really like the scene where I guess we don't find out till later, but it's the green place. Not so green anymore. And we see these like crow looking things on stilts. That was cool. I'm sure you caught this towards the end of the film, but some of the editing towards the end, or really one specific scene, felt like it was specifically made for a 3D movie. And it was where the guitar was coming at you. The steering wheel was coming at you. I don't know if we make movies for 3D anymore. I feel like I haven't seen them. But what what a time and what a stamp to that sort of editing. Because one of the other movies that's coming to mind is a Marvel movie. I'm not quite sure which one. But it's where Captain America is like throwing a shield and it looks like it's coming at you. Yeah. And I don't know. I just thought that was kind of cool how you can tell when something was made for a 3D movie. And if you showed that to a kid that didn't really get to see 3D movies like that or even experience the movie theater pre-COVID, what that would kind of look like to them if it would just look like it was coming at them, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When you know, you can't really erase it from your mind's eye. When that guitar is popping out at you, you're like, you're like, oh man, you're reminded of that stink. The wheel was kind of funny though, because it came at you and was also a transition shot. If I remember correctly, there were probably a couple other instances of, of the dregs of 3d. I'm not sure when those movies died off. I'm really not sure about the heyday of 3d movies either. It seemed to stick around a little longer than it needed to. I think I saw Iron Man 3 in 3D. We need to not bring that back. I'm just going to go ahead and say that. (laughs) We don't need 3D at home either. We don't need these 3D TVs and stuff. Aren't you a party pooper? (laughs) The the guitar one was kind of funny though because it happens in such a way that it makes it feel like you got punched in the stomach. And there's kind of like a a lean forward into it. And so it, it sells itself a little better, but... Yeah, <laughs> I noticed it. <laughs> I noticed it too, yeah. Because a lot of times, you know, with stuff kind of moving through the margins of the screen a lot of times, then you have that one thing come out through the center, and it's usually pretty corny, and it feels less corny here, but I like everything about this movie, so, so it, it, I'm now skewed on that point. <laughs> and I know you talked earlier about how this was one of your most favorite editing in a film. And I agree with you. The fighting sequence for basically the third act was very flowy here compared to the previous films. I think we got a better focus in these fighting scenes and, of course, making them cooler and crazier because we have that big nod to the poles from the first Mad Max. But here we amplify that and we have the I don't know what they're called, the pole boys. I don't know. But it's the other bad guys on poles and they're all swinging. (laughs) And at one point, Max is swinging 
and uh, oh my god it's so cool it's it's very very flowy i i don't know how else to say it besides it's continuous and very pleasurable to the eye to watch that yeah and the score does a really good job at tying all that in it helps versus like the second one it helps that we have two destinations we're going to paradise right and then we're coming back and we even have pit stops along the way, like the little mountain area where they're going to try to collapse to stop and Morton Joe from coming and everything. I like thinking about those guys around that mountain area getting paid every so often to do some kind of heist like that because it felt like they set it up pretty quick to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is their this go, is go, their go. job. And another thing I noticed editing wise, I assume, is the speeding up of some of the sections like making the action that some of these characters are doing fast did we have that in the other films and if we did i don't know if i quite noticed because i've been just on a mad max we have one really awkward one kick in mad max 2 when the kid uses the boomerang it's very similar to that except we have figured out or they figured out how to make it really effective okay yeah it was really bizarre in Mad Max 2. I think that might have been the only moment that happened too, but it feels stylistic here. Yes. And it felt experimental there, maybe. Yes, yes, I agree. It felt purposeful here, for sure, at least. Because it also ties into this high octane, you know, just total madness that we've set up. We don't have that in the second one. It just maybe wasn't possible. Right. And like you said, the score at the time, man, I mean, for most movies at the time and before, the score just didn't elevate very many things. Like, sure, we had our Star Wars at the time of Mad Max 2 and 3 especially, but scores were very lackluster. They had a long time to develop fully until a lot of the scores we've had over the last 30 years. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Almost like you only had a specific amount of sound you could pick from and throw it in your movie and now it's endless speaking of sounds they used whale sounds to help make some of the war rig sounds just another moby dig point really <laughs> like when it was breaking and stuff I, you know i couldn't tell you to be <laughs> honest but supposedly okay that's funny because all the sounds sound great like they just sound so natural and perfect also like that we kept some of the brutality here that we have in the other films. And this one's probably the most brutal. And of course, I'm talking about the scene where his favorite pregnant wife gets got. And she gets rolled under the monster-like truck car that Immortan Joe's driving. Yeah, they tease you. Just like in with anything else in any other movie, they tease you a little bit of, Oh, man, that just missed them a little bit, and then they get got, like, mostly horror movies, I guess, but they, they really get her. <laughs> yep. It's probably as brutal as his wife getting got and his baby getting got in the first one, but I like that we kept that element here. It's like, uh, oh, yeah, let's remind the audience that we're rough here. We don't play around here. Yeah, they kind of struggle with maybe the degree of lethality to uh, an emotional degree. Because we have these kamikaze style guys, the action is, the violence and the death is is maybe a little gamey. Yeah, the war boys are having so much fun killing themselves that you don't think about it. And if you are not familiar with the original three, you may feel like everybody's safe. That's a good point. And to wrap this up, I really like the end. After Mad Max has saved Furiosa, he's basically save the wives they're going back to the citadel you think this is going to be a good happy story and he's going to stay with them and help them rebuild and what but no this is mad max we're talking about reminding us of that legend and he leaves and i like that he didn't get on the platform everyone's kind of looking around for him but he's he's leaving he's got to continue and i did read that george miller was playing around with an alternate ending where he made him stay and finally give him a new home. 
but I like his choice. I like that we kept it true to the original. Yeah, is Max ever going to settle down? I don't think so. Once you kill a man's kid, a man's <laughs> wife, and a man's dog, he's not settling nowhere. You don't choose this life. This life chooses you. <laughs> exactly. With all four of these films, we we're building this case of this mythological man. It almost seems antithetical to Max's character at this point. So, because I know he struggled with, is this the moment when Max finds his humanity mm -hmm. and wants to kind of renegotiate with himself of what the human experience is? But this decision, I feel like, starts to paint the picture of there isn't any greener grass. It's very temporary. It's fleeting at every moment. And Max just intersects with that every once in a while. I don't think there will be a climax to Max's story. Yeah, I think his climax already happened. <laughs> yeah, and you know? I, maybe death, I guess, yeah. is the climax. But, but yeah, man, thank you for watching these films with me, all four of these, and especially Fury Road. It is a favorite of mine. Has been since it came out. Still is. I like it even more now. You're welcome. Thank you for making me watch this. Thank you for making me watch all of them. Thank you for making me be a Mad Max fan because I definitely would have not watched these on my own ever. I love over-the-top movies, and that can come in a lot of different flavors. But I love this one for its over-the-topness. Do you have a budget guess for this monster? Well, 30 years later, he's had... Time, money, success, yeah. I don't know. Happy Feet 1 and 2. Ha oh, yeah. <laughs> Happy Feet 1 and 2. Happy Feet is is a good one. I'm going with $75 million, but you saying big is giving me a clue? Are you giving me a clue? It's a monster of a movie. It's obviously a monster of a movie. <laughs> okay, well, then... <laughs> See, and it's like Australian, and I don't know. I, I'm going with $75 million. It's probably more. It says here that it was about $185 million. $185 million. Probably one of the most expensive movies ever made. It went on to make $380 million, so not a massive hit like we would, you know, maybe expect. Why? I don't know. It's, uh... I don't know if Mad Max has ever been a massive hit. Of course, relative to its budget, the first Mad Max was a massive hit. Relative, of course, but even still. Well, that's sad. This is even sadder. With 1.96 million people on Letterboxd, where were they at the movie theater? They Holy didn't, crap. They didn't go and see it, They did obviously. not go and see it. They weighed in at a 4.2, which is cool. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm giving it a 4. Yeah, this is a solid 4.5 for me. In a year or two, I could see it creeping up to a 5, but that takes time, generally. Yeah, I think I would have to warm up to Furiosa's character to give this any higher. If we could just replace her with Nux and just have like a Nux and Max coupleness there. We, <laughs> a proper buddy cop Max, Mad Max movie. Yes, <laughs> yes. And then it did win a lot of awards at the Academy Awards. Oh, what did it win? It got nominated for 10 awards, but it won six with Best Film Editing, Best Production Design, Best Costume Design, Best Makeup and Hairstyling, Best Sound Mixing, and Best Sound Editing. Not score. That's kind of crazy. That was probably one of its nominations. I wonder what beat it. It looks like The Hateful Eight won Best Original Score. That's a great movie, too, yeah. What about Best Picture? Best Picture looks like went to Spotlight. Not sure what that is. Yeah, I've heard that's a great movie. I... But hey, that's the year Leo finally got his Oscar for The Revenant. All right, man. Well, thank you for talking about this movie today. Thank you guys for listening to this episode of The Film of Steins. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Hopefully we did this near-perfect movie some justice remember we post every monday wednesday and friday on patreon.com slash filmasteins apple Podcasts, spotify pandora youtube remember to leave nice comments thoughts and ideas on our patreon as well come request a movie come subscribe for a dollar two dollars five dollars come request a movie 
Go request the Fantastic Beasts movies. Oof. We appreciate all the support, but until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for today's episode of The Film Stein. Thanks for tuning in and joining us on our cinematic journey. We hope you enjoyed the discussion and gained some new insights and perspectives on the world of movies. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, especially Patreon at patreon.com slash and follow us on social media for more film-related content. We love hearing from our listeners, so if you have any feedback, suggestions, movie recommendations, or book recommendations, please feel free to reach out to us. Until next time, keep watching and keep loving the magic of movies. This is The Film Steins, signing off. Grrr.